I'd like to provide for you a series of lectures on a topic that has been, for the most part, bypassed by traditional philosophy ever since the time of Aristotle. And that's the topic of comedy and the comic in general. The first treatise on art that we have in our Western tradition was written by the great philosopher Aristotle. And although Aristotle's work was mostly on art in general, he focused his topic on trage tragedy, tragic theater, which as you probably know, the Greeks invented, because he felt that this was the highest form of art. But his theory was about all art in general. There were also an extended discussion in that early treatise on comedy, but the comic part has been lost through posterity. So all we have is the tragic part. But we do have some comments that he made about comedy. And one comment was that it's not as serious and it's not as um, worthy of our philosophical reflection as tragedy. But he did have an extended discussions of comedy. Well, ever since Aristotle, although the great philosophers, Immanuel Kant, um, Nietzsche, and some of the great thinkers that came in between Aristotle and ourselves, they said quite profound things about comedy. But no one, to my knowledge, has given, developed a treatise, a little a, a sustained book on comedy per se. Now in contemporary times, there are a lot of people, a lot of books and so many philosophers. In fact, some of my teachers back at Penn State wrote extensively on comedy. So, but my point is that for the most part, the great thinkers of our Western tradition, although they've said profound things about comedy, this was a topic that has been overlooked. But there's one philosopher who didn't overlook it because he realized the profound significance of this phenomenon, and that's Henri Bergson. Now, Bergson is one of those great philosophers we have in our Western tradition. He belongs to contemporary French philosophy, uh, and he dominated the European intellectual world, at least in France, for like 50 years. And he died in 1941, the very day the Germans marched into Paris. Bergson wrote about all kinds of things, not just comedy. In fact, that's one of the, the little treatise called Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic, which I'd like to um, talk about with you. That's uh, not one of his major works. His major work is called Creative Evolution. And he wrote many works in metaphysics, that is the study of reality, on epistemology, uh, and every topic of philosophy. He's one of those great philosophers. And then the other thing about Bergson is that he's a wonderful writer. If you want to learn how to write and speak well, my teacher told me years ago, then listen and read the great thinkers and read with four eyes. With two eyes, read what's being said. With the other two eyes, read how it's being said. And so you can emulate good style. And all the French philosophers have tried to rise up to that kind of great style of uh, Bergson. Um, some, some even surpassed Bergson, but he was quite articulate and a great teacher. So there's this phenomenon, the comic. Sometimes philosophers take uh, adjectives and turn them into like nouns. And so when, he, when Bergson uses the expression, the comic, he means comedy both in art, because we know that there, there's literature that's comic, there's theater that's comic, there's operas that are comic, there's video, there are films that are comic in, nowadays. So comedy finds its place in art. There's stand-up comedy, which is, you know, um, <clears throat> another form of, uh, of comic art. So comedy finds its place in art. But comedy also finds its place in life. And so it sort of straddles these two worlds between art and life. Because things happen in life that are just funny and comedic. So what Bergson is focusing on, he calls his book Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic. And he wants to let his 
reflections shed light both on comedy as it expresses itself in art, even in Shakespeare's comedies, for example, in high art, or in life, in those funny little moments that take place in life. Just last night, I sat down in a lounge chair in the backyard. I thought it was just um, damp, and it was like a puddle of six inches of water, and it was cold. And so I, I burst out laughing and stood up. You know, it's just this simple little comedic moment. But, but what Bergson is concerned about is, what is it then that makes people laugh? You know, if you think about this phenomenon, it reaches back to like the beginnings of time, of human times. I can imagine cavemen, you know, laughing at certain things that happen in life. And it's absolutely ubiquitous. I mean, every nation, every place on this world has it, it's uh, as their comic expressions. And they, they differ from nation to nation. Like the Italian sense of humor is different from the Germans. The Italians are very bawdy and outrageous where the, sen the, the sense of humor of the Germans, one could say is m maybe more intellectual. Or, but it's hard to speak of, of national you know, senses of humor. But my point is that comedy reaches everywhere on this earth. And it reaches all the way back to the beginnings of time. So it's a significant phenomenon. Now, what's so wonderful about Bergson's reflections on comedy is that he express, and I think this is the most philosophical part of his book. He lets, he lets us in on the great function of comedy because if everything in life serves a function, then comedy wouldn't have been around for so long, both in life and in art, if it had not served some function. But Bergson opened my mind to the great function that comedy effects. So that will be one of the things I want to focus on. <clears throat> the book is called, as I said, Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic. And the first thing I do when I look at a book, I, I really study the table of contents. And so if you look at the table of contents of this little book, actually it's a very, very small book. That's why I put the whole thing there for you to read. In fact, this, the little, little books are called monographs. They're sort of like in between a book and an essay. They're like big essays. The book is divided into three chapters. The first chapter is called The Comic in General. So that's an important chapter because Bergson is going to lay out his general theory of comedy. And that's going to animate everything he says in all three chapters. So you need to get a handle on that. And he's going to return to that again and again and say it in different ways. But in chapter one, he says it for the first time, he gives you a glimpse of the essence of the comic. And so you want to get a hold of that and hang on to that. And then whenever he touches upon that again, add that to what you just understood. You want to get a very clear understanding of, of what the essence of comedy is for Bergson. So that's the first big topic you want to look for. And then he takes that, that little element, that essence of comedy, and he shows in chapter one how it expresses itself in various forms, various elementary forms, showing more and more complicated forms, more and more subtle forms, and in movement in bodily movement. And he shows how this elementary insight into the comic, what, what we might call the comic element, how it expands itself in more and more complex forms, more and more subtle forms, and more and more into the interiority of human nature. So that's an overview of chapter one. What he does in chapter two is he takes this same comic element that he unfolded in, in chapter one, and he shows how it expresses itself in various, what I call comic formulae. You know what a formula is, it's an abstract expression of something, and it needs to be instantiated. Like if I say, if P then Q, P, therefore Q, that's a formula 
in logic that's called modus ponens. If P, then Q, P, therefore Q. But P and Q can be anything. If I say, if there is inversion, then there is laughter. There is inversion, therefore there will be laughter. Now I've made a comic formula and P now means inversion and Q means there will be laughter. So if I say, if there is inversion, like when things suddenly turn topsy-turvy, then there will be laughter. There is inversion, like we might, when we look at this film, Young Frankenstein, you'll see that there's a great inversion that takes place. At the beginning, young Frankenstein doesn't want anything to do with his grandfather's work. And then he becomes obsessed with his grandfather's work. That's a radical inversion. So that lends itself to laughter. So now what I've done is I've instantiated P and Q for if there's inversion, there's laughter. There is inversion. See, and I might point to a place where there's a radical inversion. Therefore, there's laughter. Or it can be something as simple as my sitting in that puddle of water on the lounge chair. You know, I'm going to sit down and relax, and suddenly I stand up, you know, because I've just sat in a puddle of water. There's an inversion there. Now, inversion is not the only comic formula that Bergson will talk about. I chose that deliberately because that's one of the comic formula. Some philosophers think that's like the essence of comedy, that all comedy involves inversion. For Bergson, that's only one comic formula um, among many formulae. So what he'll do in chapter two then is to show how this comic element expands itself into situations. And he'll articulate a series of these comic in, uh, formulae, like inversion, for example, that I just talked about. And then, of course, since we humans live in language, I mean, we make language the way spiders make webs, we live in language, then words become funny and comical and they evoke laughter. So he talks about these comic formulae in words. And that's gonna be very important because comedy it lives in language as we live in language. And then the final chapter, he'll speak of the comic in character. There are certain characters that evoke laughter and are comedic, both in life and in art. And in art, it's deliberate. And usually the artist is skilled in developing these comic characters. In life, it just happens that some people, their characters are comedic. So that's chapter three. And in all three chapters, he begins, he, he, he develops another topic which I think is the most philosophical part. The whole book is philosophical, but the most philosophical part is showing the great function of comedy. And we'll, talk, we'll look about that. So these are the main topics of the book. I would boil it down to three. Get a hold of the comic element. And he's going to let, lay that out in chapter one. And he'll return to it in all three chapters. Make sure you get a, a handle on that. The second thing are, try to remember these comic formulae, like inversion is one, we'll talk about so many others. Certain things that when they're made concrete and instantiated with real life content, then they become comedic. And then the third major topic is the function of comedy. So sometimes it's best when you read if you're looking for something. But be thinking when you're reading, what is it? This is one of the things about philosophy is sometimes we return to things that seem obvious, but upon deeper reflection, it's not so obvious. And then they become the, the, the same phenomenon becomes much more strange and, and thought provoking. So comedy is one of those things. It, you know, it's a strange thing that we do as humans. And there's this inarticulate utterance that bubbles forth from our, from our vocal apparatus and our whole bodies. And, and we laugh and it's very enjoyable. 
but at the same time there's this illumination this awareness that's taking place that's quite valuable for society and for human beings as a species otherwise if it wasn't valuable if it didn't serve a function it would have just disappeared long ago okay so let's um let me just move into the first part of the chapter one so there are these uh, parts of each chapter and i'd like to just go over with you um, part one and part two of chapter one and i'm going to make a series of shorter uh, videos that way you just don't get overwhelmed by one big long video so the first thing he does is offer a little introduction so I'll leave you, um, he starts off, what does laughter mean? That's how, so the whole book is going to be a response to that question. And he sets up his uh, approach to comedy in that little introduction. But the book really starts, uh, the substance of the book starts with Roman numeral one of chapter one. And he lays out three important observations about comedy. The first one is not so uh, ground shaking. His point is that the comic is something peculiarly human. Okay, it's, it's a human phenomenon. So um, he says, in fact, several have defined man that is humans, as the animal who laughs. So it's humans who laugh. And what do we laugh at? We laugh at other humans. Now we may laugh at like a funny hat, we may laugh at uh, an animal, but only insofar as we humanize that hat. We look at the strange shape the hat makes by humans, or we personify the animal for example, in Young Frankenstein, the horses whinny every time someone mentions Frog Blucher. So we laugh. There are several reasons we laugh, according to Bergson. That very phenomenon, that very episode illustrates many um, comic formula working simultaneously. But one, one is the sheer repetition, the mechanical repetition of the of the name Frau Blucher. But the other one is we assume that the horses know what that word means. So horses don't know the word Blucher unless you've taken your time to train them, you know, and maybe after some reinforcements they, but it's obvious they don't know the word Blucher. And every time they do that mechanically, this, they whinny. So it, in, it, <clears throat> It's a personification of the horse. So that's the first uh, example. He says, a landscape may be beautiful, charming, or sublime, insignificant or ugly, but it will never be laughable. You may laugh at an animal, but only because you have detected in it some human attitude or expression. So his point is that this, this phenomenon is uniquely human, okay? It's humans who laugh and what humans laugh at are other humans. So that one is not ground shaking. The second point though, when I first read it, was quite counterintuitive. He says, here I would point out a symptom equally worth pointing out, the absence of feeling. Now that one made me scratch my head at first and ponder, like, because I love to laugh, everyone loves to laugh. And when you laugh, you feel good. It's a good feeling. So what does he mean that laughter involves the absence of feeling? Well, you have to read on, you have to read very carefully. That's another thing I wanna point out as we go. When you read philosophy, you can't race through it. It's like racing through a museum. When you're done, you just see a blur. So what you have to do is read it and well there's readings in their readings what i do is just read it 
the first time to get an overview and I move at a pretty good pace. Then you have to go back and go very slowly. And that, in fact, I found that to be my forte. I go very, very, very slowly. And I try to pay attention to every little nuance the way a literary critic would do rather than a philosopher or a film critic would do rather than a philosopher of film. In other words, get very close to the text try to pay attention to every little nuance to the context. Context is, is the key. But um, his point here is that when he says it's the absence of feeling, he says there's an absence of feeling that usually accompanies laughter. What he means by that is that there's a certain um, bracketing or postponing of feelings of pity or compassion that takes place. Like if someone were to see me sitting in that puddle of water and they're worried that I was gonna catch a cold, it wouldn't be funny. But it was funny, it was funny because anybody watching that or myself watching myself sitting in that water <clears throat> had to bracket my own feelings. Wow, this is cold. The coldness made me even burst out even more. But, but the fact, what Bergson is saying is that whenever we laugh at anything, we can't feel any kind of pity or compassion for the person we're laughing at. Like, look at all the jokes that are made for politicians. I mean, some of them are downright cruel. I mean, if it gets too cruel, then it's just in bad taste. You know, if it, like, your brother may tease you and say some mean thing. And then he says, ah, oh, come on, can't you just take a joke? Well, you know, it depends on the joke, right? So if you push the cruelty too far, then it just becomes downright cruel. But Bergson's point is, is more theoretical than that. He's just saying, whenever we do laugh, if there's feelings of compassion or pity, or pity um, then it's not gonna appear funny. You're not gonna laugh. Okay. Now he elaborates on all these things. I'm just trying to give you the gist of each of these points. So that's, that's an important, actually, um, there's, if you think about that, there's, there's a lot of meaning pregnant in, in that observation, because what he's saying is that laughter is an intellectual phenomenon. See, that's counterintuitive. That's not what you would think, right? You would think it's just like some, some feeling that just, bubbles forth and you laugh. But what he's saying is that when we laugh, it's our intellect that's informing our body to laugh. This is a purely intellectual phenomenon. And that connects with human nature, the, the main definition of the human that has dominated Western philosophy is that humans are rational animals. The, w the way we differ from all other animals is that we have intellects. Now, animals have a mind, of course, they have memory, and it depends on uh, how highly developed the species of animal you're talking about. Like when you're talking about dolphins and chimpanzees and dogs and things like that, it's a lot different than gerbils. And, but of course, animals have a mind, but intellect has to do with reflecting on the principles of things, on first principles. Like you can be sure my dogs are not worrying about the principles of comedy right now. They're just waiting, you know, when's the next time they're gonna play. Okay, so that's the second um, point. He says, to produce the whole effect of comedy then, the comic demands something like a momentary anesthesia, you know, anesthetic. Aesthetic means what gives itself to the senses. So anesthetic is deadening the senses, like an anesthetic, right? a momentary anesthesia of the heart. The heart is a metaphor for feeling. Its appeal is to intelligence, pure and simple. So I pondered that when I first read that. I mean, I, I start thinking that's counterintuitive and, and there may be something to that. That we're, when, we, when we see these people who have a good a cultivated sense of humor, when they see the absurd or the ridiculous and they burst out laughing, what's happening is they're 
activating the intelligence. Intelligent people have a good sense of humor. Perhaps when we engage in the comic, we cultivate our human nature because human nature is to be rational animals. So that's some of the meaning that's in that second point. The third point he makes, he says, this intelligence, however, must always remain in touch with other intelligences. So here comes the social element of comedy. Our laughter, he says, is always in a group. However spontaneous it seems, laughter always implies a kind of secret, secret complic complicity with other laughers, real or imagined, imaginary. What he means by that is what humans do is single out a particular type of person within their group, and then the joke makes sense. I always think about this series that was on television, it's called The Sopranos, it was quite well done. And Tony Soprano um, was a mob boss in New Jersey. Well, I grew up as an Italian American and these people, my family were not in the mafia, but we, we knew these people. So I, I knew the world of that world. And so when I watched the series, I could appreciate how well done the series was. It won all kinds of Emmy Awards and everything. You may have seen it, or maybe not. <laughs> it's called The Sopranos. It was really well done, but it was very funny to me. It was a dark humor, but it was funny to me. And somebody else who had not grown up in that environment may not have understood the, 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 the comedy involved in that. So it always involves a group, he says. To understand laughter, we must put it back into its natural environment, which is society. And above all else, we must determine the utility of its function, which is a social one. We'll return to the function of comedy. So he summarizes on the bottom of page four, let us clearly mark the point out, uh, the point towards which our three preliminary observations are converging. And then he has a very good way of summarizing things. You can learn that how to write and uh, well and speak well from Bergson. After you've developed an idea, then summarize it and then move on, make some transition and then move on. So he summarizes his observations here. The comic will come into being, it appears, whenever a group of men humans, he means. This is, was written in French, you know, so they translate it into English. Usually not much is lost from French to English. Some nuance is lost, of course. When you go from ancient languages to modern, then a lot is lost. And then if you go to non-Western languages like Chinese or say, and then, it, a lot, then it really depends on the uh, translators. But usually people who translate these works that are published on university presses, they know both the philosophy and they're fluent in, in both languages. So you don't have to worry, but sometimes you lose the nuance. But when he says men, he means humans. The comic will come into being, it appears, whenever a group of humans concentrate their attention on one of their number. Okay, so that's the human part. Imposing silence on their emotions. It's good to memorize certain locutions, that way you get it right. Just remember, imposing silence on their emotions. But later on in the book, he'll specify what emotions, namely pity, compassion. And calling into play nothing but their intelligence. So that was that other point. So those are some preliminary observations. It's good. I just went over those with you because I want you to understand them. And that way you'll move into the main point, uh, which is coming up now in section two with the context that you need to understand it. So those are three observations he makes. And those are gonna help you understand the function of comedy as it unfolds. Now, the next passage moves all the way from page four, all the way to uh, page nine and well, actually to page 11, the beginning of section three, chapter one. This is a very important section, so read it carefully. What he's gonna do there is adumbrate or let uh, articulate the comic element. And he's going, 
he's going to orchestrate that later on. It's like Beethoven's symphony, bum, 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 bum. And then later, bum, 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 bum. And he'll orchestrate that. But you have to get the bum, 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 bum first to be able to appreciate the orchestration that comes later. So this is the, the, the gist of it. And he does it in a very masterful way. What he does, a lot of people like they'll, when they write, they'll make a point and then they give examples to exemplify their point, which is the way it's been done forever. But Brixon did something intriguing here and innovative. Instead of making a point and then giving examples to exemplify the point, what he did is piled up a series of examples, like uh, five examples. In each example, the first example is quite rudimentary, like basic, as basic as it gets. And then he made another example based on that, a little more complex and a little more subtle and a little more interior to the person. Those three things, more complex, more subtle, more interior to the person. And then he made another example. And this one is even more complex, more interior, more subtle. And he made five examples. And each time he made an example, he pulled that thread through all the examples. And then at the end, he summarizes all five examples and makes his point, which is masterful. And so I'd like to go over that with you. And in so doing, what he does is gives us a preliminary glimpse into the comic element, that bum, 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 like, you know, he gives you the gist of it. And then he's gonna go back, that's gonna animate everything. So that's why that's so important. So let's follow him here. Let's look at the first example. A man running along the street stumbles and falls. The passers-by burst out laughing. It's like me sitting in that puddle in, in the lounge chair from yesterday. It's very basic, right? Clowns do it all the time. They fall down. You know, um, actors do it. Cary Grant, you know, did it in, in a masterful way. Um, different dancers pretend to be clumsy, but they're really not clumsy. You know, it's, it's very basic. But let's just take, uh, take his example. A guy's running down the street, he trips on a stone and he falls down and all the passers-by laugh. So why is that funny? What made them laugh? Well, he starts examining this philosophically. They would not laugh at him, he writes, could they suppose that the whim had suddenly seized him to sit down on the ground? Like if he decided, I, I'm too tired, I, need, I just need to sit down, and he sits down, it's not funny. They laugh because his sitting is involuntary. Now, there's something about the involuntary. He didn't deliberately sit down, that wouldn't make it funny. He trips on the stone, and he didn't do it deliberately. Have you ever walked through the woods and your foot gets caught on a um, stump or something and you trip and you sort of laugh to yourself maybe? So he writes, consequently, it's not his sudden change of attitude that raises a laugh, but rather the involuntary element in the change, his clumsiness. So now he's going to focus on the clumsiness, the involuntary. Perhaps there was a stone in the road he should have altered his pace and avoided the obstacle. Now, the point is he didn't alter his, you know, if he were a Tai Chi master, you know, he would have seen the stone, he was mindful, he would have compensated his steps and not stepped on the stone and he would never have tripped, right? But he's not a Tai Chi master, you know, he's not a gymnast, he didn't see it, he wasn't being mindful, he just, and we don't blame him for it, but we do laugh. So why? Well, instead of altering his pace, instead of being mindful of the environment, what happened? Now here's the, here's the crux, through lack of elasticity. Now that seems like a simple thing, but it's a very important thing. You need to think about these words. When something is elastic, it means it bends. It bends to the contours of the forces that are pressing on it one way or the other. If something is inelastic, 
it means it doesn't bend. Now, reality for Bergson, I've studied Bergson's metaphysics and taught it, so this helped me to understand his, meta, his theory of comedy. I know that for Bergson, reality is a ceaseless flow of novelty, okay? Bergson is very different in the history of Western philosophy insofar as he believes that reality is not static being, but a flow of becoming. No two moments are ever the same. So reality is, is a ceaseless flow of novelty. Each moment is unique and new. There's a certain progress and animation to things that are moving in a certain direction, but each of these moments are different. So reality is this becoming, it's not being. Nothing really is, everything is in the making. So in order to attune oneself to reality, we have to be mindful of the changes. Have you ever noticed things don't go the way you plan always? I mean, it's good to have plans, but when the plan doesn't work, you have to change your plan. You know, they say that's why great generals are great generals. Like, like Caesar and Alexander the Great, they could change plans on, on the spot, depending on what's happening. Okay, so this person is just running. He's not mindful. He didn't alter his pace. He's instead through lack of elasticity, through absent mindedness, which is the opposite of mindfulness, right? A kind of physical obstinacy, okay? So usually the word obstinate is connected with your people's minds, like they're, they're stubborn, you know, they have a hard head. But there can be a physical obstinacy, like you're just moving through the body, uh, through the world in a kind of mechanical way. As a result, in fact, of rigidity or momentum. So all these key words, rigidity, inelasticity, absent-mindedness, momentum. The muscles continue to perform the same movements when they should have altered. When the circumstances of the case called for something else, the world is calling for behaviors. We have to listen to the world. So if we don't listen, then sometimes we become disconnected with the unfolding of reality. So this is going to be the comic element for Bergson, this lack of elasticity, this automatism, this inability to ad adapt to the changing flow of reality. And that's going to be the base. And that's why we laugh when somebody you know, just falls. Now, clowns do it deliberately. Actors do it deliberately. They're not really falling, but you know they pretend to be falling. And sometimes it takes incredible body awareness and um, agility to be able to do that. So that's, that's going to be the, the most rudimentary fundamental uh, insight. Now, like I told you, he's, he'll take another example and pile it on top of that. And this that next example is going to be a little more complex and a little more subtle and a little more interior to the person. So his example two is this. Take the case of a person who attends to the petty occupations of everyday life with mathematical precision. He's a, you know, a very um, structured person. The objects around him have all been tampered with by a mischievous wag. What he means is, what he's talking about here is the practical joke. So instead of the environment just being different, like there's a rock there, somebody does something. They put mud in the inkwell or tacks on the seat. I remember in third grade, my, my colleagues, I remember I didn't laugh because I was compassionate at that time. And the teacher sat down on a bunch of tacks and you know, everybody laughed. And I, I found myself not laughing, but actually there's Bergson's theory. Remember at the beginning, if you feel compassion, it's not gonna be laughing, it's not gonna be funny. So I remember not laughing at that, but everybody else laughed because why because they bracketed their feelings of pity for the teacher and they manipulated the environment and she sat down on these tacks 
which I found was too cruel. You know, that's like, like that's like an assault. I mean, so, so the laugh, the laughable element in both cases, that is the person running who trips and falls and the person who is, um, falls to uh, the practical joke. The laughable element in both cases consists of a certain mechanical inelasticity. So, you know, hang on to these words. You know, I found that to be helpful when I study philosophy or anything actually. Sometimes there are locutions, like when Bergson said, reality is a ceaseless flow of novelty. You know, I just remember that because it's so well said and it's exactly what he means. So remember the expression mechanical inelasticity. The laughable element in both cases, what cases? The man running and stumbling and falling and the person who falls uh, prey to this practical joke, in both cases consists of a certain mechanical inelasticity. If the teacher would have looked down and saw the been mindful of where she's sitting, she wouldn't sit on tax, right? But we forgive her for that because you don't sit down every time and anticipate someone putting tax on your seat. Just, and here's an expression you may want to also memorize, just where one would expect to find the wide awake adaptability and the living pliableness of the human being. See, I find that to be a very important expression because it's going to fall, it's going to help us understand the function of comedy. We're going to see if the, the comic artist, for example, is going to, is going to uh, put before our eyes people who are mechanically inelastic, the awareness that dawns on the people who are laughing is how wonderful it would have been, it is, to be wide awake, to be mindful. and to be adaptable, and to be pliable as a human being. So comedy is going to function. That's the third topic I wanted to touch on, but right now that I want to touch on that more carefully as we proceed. It's going to function, comedy is going to function to tune us to reality. Well, let's move on a little more quicker pace here. I'm going pretty slowly because I, I, I don't want, I want you to appreciate the nuance of all the ideas. Now, the third example he gives is absent-mindedness. There are certain times, and I'll let you do the readings carefully yourself. I'll just give you the gist of it. There are certain times where we're just um, paying attention to what just happened and something else is happening, but we're so focused on what just happened, we lose the next thing that's happening. Sometimes that happens when people get older because you can't attend to things as well uh, uh, when you get older, actually. So, I mean, it depends on who you are, of course, but everything else being equal, older people, you know, have more difficulty in attending to many things at once. So something is happening, and so they attend to that. Meanwhile, something else just happened. So get with it. I mean, there's something new happening. Well, they're, they're still connected to what just happened. So they're disconnected from the flow. And uh, not just old people, but anybody who's disconnected and anybody who's expressing, uh, who's showing absent-mindedness, absent-mindedness, then it becomes comic. But again, think about it. There's that element of rigidity there, of inelasticity, because we're so focused on what just happened, we forgot about what's happening. Or it could happen, I mean, time flows, right? So you have the past, you have the, the present, and the present is haunted by the past, and it's pregnant with the future. So it's flowing. Um, if somebody's so caught up in the past, that they can't even be in the moment, then it becomes comical. Or if somebody is so caught up in the moment that they can't even see what's happening in the next moment, well, that would be like 
if you're caught up in the in the moment then that's all right because the moment is pregnant with the future you'd be aware of what's happening but if you're caught up in what just happened which is really the past and you're not aware about what's happening then you're not in the moment so this is called absent-mindedness and that becomes a kind of inelasticity the third example he gives is not so much absent-minded but being so obsessed with something it can be an idea an ideal like there's a great the the literary uh, example he gives is called don quixote which was written by cervantes and it's one of the great treasures of classical literature it's great spanish literature and don quixote was obsessed with chivalry and with becoming a knight but he was so obsessed with that that he he saw windmills as dragons and he was he was like living in another reality so Berson calls this type of person the over romantic it's not so much they're absent minded as it is that their their mind is so obsessed with some ideal that it becomes comical and there are people who are political like that you know they're people who are obsessed with ideas that are that pervade their being so much so that they just forget about everything else like when people so he calls that the over romantic somebody who's full of wild enthusiasm and there's no they're they're rigidly adhering to this ideal and that blinds them to everything else to the flow of reality the next example he gives is different different um, distortions of character like some people have vices or in art there are vices that are being exaggerated in art and they become comedic they become comical do you ever watch saturday night live or they'll take politicians they'll take certain aspects of their character and exaggerate it and it becomes comical so there are certain comic vices you know vice is the opposite of virtue right so if a virtue is an excellence of character a vice is some deficiency some deformity some deformity in one's character like someone could be obsessively vain for example and they're so vain that they don't see their own vanity of course that's part of what it means to be vain you think you're more than you are everybody else can see how vain you are but you don't see how vain you are so com com comic writers can capitalize on that and show how they could exemplify how vain somebody is and so that vanity then becomes comedic but vanity itself is a kind of inelasticity the inability to see your weaknesses or to see any kind of vulnerability in yourself or to think is to be obsessed with thinking of yourself more highly than you, you should so those are the five examples and he, he each one he has a long paragraph on each one but i'm trying to give you the gist of it but i find on page nine now he summarizes all of this and he takes that thread that runs through all of these five examples remember the first example is the most rudimentary this the the runner who falls and then the simpleton who is hoaxed and then um the absent-mindedness and then the uh, the over romantic like don quixote and then um the all these comic vices and then he'll take that thread that runs through all of those and lay it out for you and give you this glimpse of the comic element and that will animate everything in the book so i want you to get a hold of that so there's a very important paragraph on page nine i'll read it to you and you can see how masterfully he summarizes these five examples he says in the first full paragraph of page nine it is unnecessary to carry this analysis any further 
from the runner who falls to the simpleton who is hoaxed, from a state of being hoaxed to one of absent-mindedness, from absent-mindedness to wild enthusiasm, from wild enthusiasm to various distortions of character and will. We didn't talk about that. The distortion of the will. That means you're adhering. The will is your desire to achieve something or to want something. And there can be distortions of the will also, which is connected with distortion of the character. He calls these comic vices. We have followed the line of progress along which the comic becomes more and more deeply embedded into the person. Because, you know, the first one, it's not deeply embedded in the person. We forgive the person for falling, but it's not really his fault. I mean, he could have been more mindful, but it's still funny. But the next one, the hoax, the simpleton who's hoaxed, then we, it's a little more interior. You could be like aware of, of what's going on a little bit better. And then the third one, you know, uh, the absent-mindedness, now it's becoming internal to the person. And then the comic vices, all these things are very internal to the person. So he goes from the external to the internal and each one gets more complex. But he, he, he draws this thread, which I find to be in, uh, masterful. We have followed the line of progress. That's the thread I'm talking about. along which the comic becomes more and more deeply embedded in the person, yet without ceasing in its subtler manifestations to recall to us some trace of what we noticed in its grosser forms, like the man who falls. And then he says it again, an effect of automatism. So auto means self, matism comes from movement. When you're moving without adjusting to the sinuosities and the changing reality. An effect of automatism and inelasticity. So hold on to that, you know, uh, not too tight, or you'll be comic yourself. Now we can obtain a first glimpse, a distant one to be sure, and still hazy and confused of the laughable side of human nature and of the ordinary function of comedy. Well, he really hasn't thematized the function of comedy, but he touched upon it. And we're going to return to that. It has to do with raising the, the person who's laughing. Their awareness is being raised, and they're watching someone from their own species being disconnected from reality in a certain way. They're, they're observing a certain mechanical inelasticity. And that provokes laughter. And that's going to serve a tremendous function for humans. Okay, I think that's enough for now. I, I, I'd like you to go ahead and finish the chapter one, and then we're going to move on. And I'll, I'll lay bare for you some, uh, I'll identify some of these comic formulae for you next time. But um, this is a, uh, it's a strange topic. Like I said, it's not one of the main topics of philosophy. I, th I guess if it were put, um, the philosophy of comedy, I guess if it were put somewhere, it would be like a sub-discipline of aesthetics, of philosophy of art, because comedy is an art form. But um, like I said, Bergson is talking about the comic in life too. You know, the, the, and that's what stand-up comedians are talking about. But it seems to me an artistic uh, phenomenon, though, uh, even when it's in life, because if you see something, if you see something in life that provokes laughter and you're aware of the absurdity of it, then you yourself are being the comedian. I mean, you have to look at it because every, someone else could see it and it's not funny to that person. So in order to observe something as funny, you have to have a sense of humor. And the sense of humor involves an, an artistic uh, composing of the phenomenon uh, in such a way that it provokes laughter. So it, even if, if it's something that happens in life that provokes laughter, and it's not really something in art, um, I think the person who is um, laughing is the comic artist. So that's just 
a, a little side insight that I just had just now. Okay, so um, I wanted to start off with something light and um, and at the same time deep and philosophical, uh, given these troubling times we're we're going through. Okay, I'll see you next time.